in an, an irrelevant way. Maybe in a pompous way, just trying to show off his own learning and without really addressing the concerns of the question. Okay, then the third mark of the foolish person, okay, when another person replies to the question, yoni so, in a way that's thorough, precise, pertinent, pithy, using the appropriate language, then the person who asks the question doesn't approve of it, doesn't accept the answer. And that doesn't mean that when somebody answers your question that you can challenge them or ask further questions. Of course, you can ask more questions. But what's indicated here is the foolish person is one who is maybe envious of the person who's answering the question or he wants to embarrass and humiliate the person who's answering the question to um, in some way disparage and denigrate the person who's answering the question. And so the fool refuses to accept the answer, doesn't approve of it. And then the wise person is just the opposite in all respects. Formulates the question wisely and appropriately, replies appropriately, and when the person replies to the question, then one approves of it. Again, it doesn't mean you have to agree and accept it 100%, but you have to recognize that the person who's replying has given a pertinent and meaningful reply to the question. Okay, sutta number six, again it states the same point as we've already made, just different words. Okay. Unwholesome bodily action, verbal action, and mental action. And the wise person by wholesome bodily action, verbal action, mental action. Number seven, again, it's just the descriptive term that changes in each sutta, blameworthy versus blameless. Number eight, afflictive versus unafflictive. Okay, number nine. Introduces some new ideas. Okay, here it says that possessing three qualities, the foolish, incompetent, bad person, Yeah, the Pali uses the expression or the word here, asapuriso, and this is the opposite of sapuriso. The word sapuriso, the word puriso is person, and then sap stands for the word sat, which means good. One of the meanings is good. And then the opposite is asap, or asat, not good or bad. Okay, so this is the foolish, incompetent, bad person maintains himself, actually three things are going to be mentioned here, maintains himself in a maimed and injured condition, that is the person who indulges or engages in bodily, verbal, mental misconduct, hurts themselves, injures themselves. So you could say that that is the, maybe the psychological consequence of their action. That they sort of, by engaging in unwholesome activity, they burn up their store or accumulation of good qualities 
and instead they plant bad qualities in the mind. And so they're tarnishing, they're damaging their own moral character. So that would be the first consequence of engaging in those unwholesome actions that mark one as a fool. Okay, the second consequence is that one becomes blameworthy and subject to reproach by the wise. So this, we could say that this is the moral consequence of um, engaging in unwholesome action. That it damages one's standing in the eyes of others so that wise people and good people will criticize you when one engages in this type of unwholesome action. And then the third consequence is that one generates much demerit. So what's meant by demerit is unwholesome karma. So this is karma that has the potency, the potential to ripen in the future and to bring suffering to oneself. And so when the foolish person engages in those unwholesome bodily, uh, engages in bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct, they damage their own moral character, which is something that occurs right here and now. It's visible here and now. Then they become subject to reproach by the wise. This is the way other people regard them. So they look at the foolish person, killing, stealing, addicted to sexual enjoyment, a habitual liar, slandering others, and so forth. And they say, that is a foolish, worthless person, and they don't want to associate with that person. So that's in the eyes of others, and then one generates demerit, so this is the karmic consequence. Okay, and then in the opposite case, we have the, <clears throat> the person who's described as wise, competent, and good. And this is the person who engages in good bodily conduct, good verbal conduct, and good mental conduct. So this person, you could say, obtains three benefits. First, they preserve themselves unmaimed and uninjured. In other words, they preserve their inner integrity, their moral integrity, the wholeness and solidity of their moral, char <coughs> of their moral character. The second, in relation to others, in the eyes of others, they're considered blameless and beyond reproach. And then the third is that one generates much merit by ob observing these principles of good conduct. One creates kusala karma, wholesome karma, deposits those seeds of good qualities in the mind. And when those seeds, those seeds of good qualities, those are called merit. And when the merit ripens, then it will bring good uh, beneficial conditions to oneself. You know, I think what's important to recognize here in this sutta is that we take the foolish person, so even if the foolish person is able to hide their bad deeds so that they don't have to reap the consequences of being blameworthy and subject to reproach by the wise, they could pass themselves off as a virtuous good person, but on the sly they're engaging in some kind of misconduct still they have to face the other two consequences. 
they're injuring themselves, sort of inflicting damage on their own moral character, sort of creating dark spots in their moral character. And they're generating demerit that will bounce back and come back to them in the future. You know, probably at least some of you have read the novel, was it by Oscar Wilde, The Portrait of Dorian Gray? Yeah, so this was a young man who's apparently his face was very beautiful, very handsome. And a friend of his who was a painter painted a picture of his that was very lifelike. You know, it captured his, all of his beauty, if I remember the novel correctly. Then he made this wish, may I myself in my own physical presence always preserve my, be my beautiful features and may all of, yeah, he, he makes that wish and somehow through some working of some magic, his wish comes true so that he's able to engage in all sorts of immorality, but the, they say the consequences of the immorality show up on the face in the portrait. So as he's looking at the picture, the features of the picture become uglier and uglier until they become absolutely horrific. You know, so he has to cover up the picture and then hide it I think, in the basement or the attic of his house. But he's always um, drawn to the picture out of curiosity after committing each of these different stages of moral degradation. And each time he opens the curtains and looks at the picture, the face turns uglier and uglier, more and more horrible, until at the end, what happens? I don't remember. Does he take a knife and stab the picture? I guess <laughs> all of you get an F in English 101. <laughs> he stabs the picture. And he dies. Okay, so if you want to preserve even your beautiful features, your beautiful face, no, it, it, I think it's true. I mean, you can't say that it works with 100% precision, but somebody who, when you see a person, sometimes you've never met the person before, but the, you just meet the person for the first time, and sometimes you feel just some inner revulsion towards that person some kind of anxiety or tension arises, and you feel you want to avoid that person. And then maybe later you learn that that person has been engaged in various kinds of unethical conduct. Whereas sometimes you meet somebody and they make a very powerful, positive impression, very, not because they're physically beautiful, but some kind of, you say, the beautiful vibrations spread out from that person. And so you're attracted to that person and you want to associate with them. But I say don't place 100% trust in that because I've known people who have sometimes rough appearance, but when you get to know them, you see that they're really beautiful inside. And other people who are very charming, <laughs> very sweet features, very... Um, fascinating, enticing smile, but when you get to know them, you realize that you should have kept a distance in the first place. Is that true? Okay, now we come to sutta number 10. Ah, oh, that's useful, thank you. Okay, now the Buddha speaks about, th oh, this is a bit strong, the sutta. Okay, he says, possessing three qualities and without having abandoned three stains, one is deposited in hell, 
as if brought there. So what are the three? First is that one is immoral, and one has not abandoned the stain of immorality. So this is, in Pali, this is dusila. So being dusilo. And that's the opposite of being silava. Silava is being virtuous, one who possesses good, mar good ethical behavior. Whereas dusila is being unethical in one's behavior. <clears throat> and so being unethical, immoral, sort of at minimum this would be one who transgresses and breaks the five precepts and probably breaks them in a very serious way. And then second, one is envious, and one has not abandoned the stain of envy. And the third is one is miserly, and one has not abandoned the stain of miserliness. And just sort of as a word of caution, or a word of maybe consolation, you know, almost all of us, you know, short of the level of Aryan or noble ones, have some degree of envy and some degree of miserliness. So if we see that we have these traits in ourselves, we shouldn't get terrified and think, I'm certainly going to be reborn in hell. But we just have to recognize that these are traits within ourselves that are unwholesome, and we have to train ourselves to overcome them, to weaken them, and to overcome them. But probably when it's speaking about one deposited and is leading to hell, that would be envy, which becomes so strong that the person engages in activities that are intended to harm those people that one is envious of. So say I'm, <laughs> I'm envious of another monk who's a famous Dhamma teacher. And so in my, <laughs> out of envy, when he's going to put a, give a lecture, maybe I put a thumbtack on his seat. <laughs> so he comes and everybody is waiting breathlessly for him to begin, to sit down and begin his lecture. <laughs> So he comes into the Dhamma Hall, <laughs> sits down on the seat, and then <laughs> lets out a howl, ow! <laughs> and then looks down and he sees the thumbtack on the seat. And so in this way he becomes humiliated in front of all of the whole audience. Or else in envy, I could spread like a malicious rumor about the person that, I'm, that I envy, and that way harm that person's reputation. Okay, so that is the kind of expression of envy that I think would create the, the karma that leads to hell. And then the miserliness, like this would be really strong miserliness. And I think, in my view, probably miserliness on its own, if it doesn't culminate in immoral behavior, is probably going to lead to rebirth in the sphere of the pretas rather than hell. But when the miserliness gets coupled with immoral behavior, with strong immoral behavior, then it could lead to hell. Okay, then it's the opposite qualities that lead to heaven. So being virtuous, firm in the observance of the precepts, being free from envy and abandoning the stain of envy, 
And then the opposite of envy is the quality of mudita, especially mudita, that is rejoicing in the good qualities and good fortune of others and having the kind of mind of appreciation for the good qualities of others and the mind of congratulations for the good fortune of others. And then, of course, the opposite of miserliness is generosity. Okay, so any questions at this point on anything in the first ten suttas? So it's all pretty straightforward. You were shaking your head? At the risk of being a fool. <laughs> you have a question. You have a question. I do. Yeah, go ahead and ask it. Well, uh, did you have, yeah, use the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> no, never, <laughs> never think that I'm a fool. You're laughing at me. Uh, you know, uh, we're always talking about not judging. Yeah. And um, I don't know how this falls into that concept of not judging, but I, sometimes a person can appear to be a fool and maybe they're not. Yeah. Sometimes they can appear to be wise, but yeah. maybe yeah. they're not. Yeah. I mean, I don't, this feels very simplistic to me. And I, I don't know how to really, should I be judging? That's the last. I'm sorry. Okay. You told yeah. me to use the First, microphone. okay, about this matter of not judging. This has become, it's part of the, I call it part of the rhetoric of modern Western Buddhism, but it's not so typical of what I call traditional or classical Buddhism. Um, I think if I were to follow like the kind of advice the Buddha says, uh, let's say that there's two meanings or two ideas implicit in making judgments. One idea, which is probably the idea to be rejected in being, when you say be, don't be judgmental, is basing judgments on superficial appearances and then using those judgments mm -hmm. that one makes in the mind as a basis for inflating one's own status and then denigrating others. So when we say don't be judgmental, it means don't use judgments, don't make superficial judgments and then use them just to bolster your own ego and to put down others. But the Buddha would say that one has to make judgments about people and about situations, making the judgments through investigation. So one has to investigate other people to the best of one's ability to be able to see what are their qualities, and you could determine what are their inner qualities, at least initially on the basis of their behavior. So he says, wisdom manifests in action, in conduct. So through a person's conduct, one could judge whether they're wise or whether they lack wisdom. And as I said, sometimes behavior is misleading, so when one makes a judgment, the judgment should always be a provisional or tentative judgment, not the kind of judgment that one clings to as being absolutely authoritative and final. Yeah, so one makes judgments about people based upon their behavior, and then in situations when one is at a face with choices, one has to make the appropriate judgments based on one's assessment of the situation to determine what is most helpful and beneficial of the various alternatives one faces. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Uh, I still have a hard time with it. 
I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, there was this, the story of this priest, right? This cardinal today. I, I'm just saying, you know, I really can't frame it properly, so I think I'll stop. Okay. Okay, shall we move on then to the next? Okay, so now we come to Sutta, to the second chapter. Okay, here the Buddha speaks about how a well-known or famous monk is acting for the harm of many people, for the unhappiness of many people, for the ruin, harm, and suffering of many people, even including the devas, the deities. Okay, so what are the three? He encourages them. Here it looks expression used this discordant bodily action, discordant verbal action, and discordant I think the word used is dhammas, which would be mental qualities. Yeah, the Pali word here was translated as discordant, is ananulomika. So anuloma. Loma is actually the hair of the body, like the hair of the arm. And anu means along with. So anu loma is literally that which goes along with the direction of the hair, the bodily hairs. And the opposite of that, normally it would be pati loma. That would be against the direction of the hairs. Or in English expression, we would say, Anuloma is with the grain, and patiloma is against the grain. You know, in, in, pla in planing a, a board of wood, when one goes along with the grain, that's anuloma. When one goes against the grain, that would be patiloma. So really what's meant by discordant here is the same thing would be the same thing as unwholesome, akusala. And it gives, the, yeah, it gives the example of discordant bodily action as bodily misconduct, such as taking life and so on. Oh, actually it gives maybe the note to explain how the commentary interprets this. Yeah, the commentary distinguishes gross and subtle types of discordant action. So gross discordant action, bodily action, would be, you know, the basic types of transgression of the precepts, like destroying life. But the subtle types of discordant bodily action gives examples as worshiping the directions. Like that, that was a Brahminic practice in the Buddha's time. So if, of course, if a person just on their own, they worship the directions, there's probably no inherent harm in that. But, but if a monk, a Buddhist monk, who should be teaching the Dhamma, instructs people that they should worship the directions, then that is, would be considered a subtle kind of discordant bodily action and then making offerings to the spirits. 
though actually in Buddhist countries, people do make, <laughs> it's quite common for them to make offering to the devas and to the spirits, especially to the sp spirits that are believed to dwell in the vicinity of a temple. So in Sri Lanka, for example, and virtually every temple and monastery, except for maybe the stricter forest monasteries, there'll be, like the main place of worship is the Buddha the Buddha hall, where people go to worship the Buddha and make offerings to the Buddha. But then off to the side, there'll be a little area they call the Devala, which is the area devoted to the devas, to the deities. <laughs> And so it's believed that, you see, the Buddha is the one one worships and venerates and make offerings to the Buddha for the ultimate transcendent good, you know, for liberation, for enlightenment. But if you want your son to get a good grade in school, if your wife is sick, if you want your daughter to get a good job or to find a good husband, you don't turn to the Buddha for that. <laughs> but the ones who are sort of pulling the, the strings behind the scenes are the devas. <laughs> you, you know about that? Oh, no. Excuse me? No, you're absolutely right about that. I'm exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you go off a little. Uh, often I, I see that the lay people look sort of after worshiping the Buddha, <laughs> and they come out, they sort of look around a little bit, like a little embarrassed. <laughs> and then they'll go off to the side and make the offering to the, to the devas. And sometimes I think that there are also shrines to the yakshas. Yeah, th those are the fierce spirits who have powerful, destructive power, who have destructive powers if they're not placated, but if one appeases them, then they can use their fierce power to help you. <laughs> okay, then speech. Okay, so gross discordant, spe gross discordant speech would be false speech and so on, lying, slander, harsh speech. Okay, but the subtle kind, if one does not want to give something to others, one deceives them by saying, I don't have anything to give. Or, <laughs> as my mother used to say when the telephone call would come, I gave it the office. <laughs> When the charity would call up, they would make these, they call them chain calls. Yeah, would you care to give to such and such a charity? Oh, I gave it the office. <laughs> okay, and then discordant mental action, so the gross kinds would be covetousness, ill will, wrong view, and more subtly, it says explaining a, ment a meditation subject incorrectly. But I don't see that as a mental action, that's a kind of verbal action. Okay, let us continue. Okay, and then, so that's what the way a monk, when giving discourse, he'll contribute to the harm of the people in his audience if he encourages them in discordant bodily, verbal, verbal actions and in mental qualities. And the opposite, the monk is acting for the welfare of many people by encouraging them in concordant, that's anulomika, bodily action, verbal action, and mental qualities. Okay, next is an interesting sutta. This is appropriate, especially for monastics. Okay, so 
First, the Buddha uses an analogy. He uses the analogy of the head anointed Kshatriya king. So three places that he should remember all his life. So he should remember the first, the place where he was born, then the place where he was anointed, where he was consecrated or coronated as a king. And then third is the place where he triumphed in battle and emerged victorious. Okay, so these are analogies for the stages that a monastic should go through. So three places that a monk should remember all his life. So the first is the place where he shaved off his hair and beard, put on the ochre robes, and entered upon the homeless life. Okay, the second is the place where he understood, as it really is, the Four Noble Truths. And so at the second stage, what is the status of this monk? A good scholar who's learned the Four Noble Truths, reading the suttas and the commentaries, is that what's meant? So what is meant? Technically. Stream entry. Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, so this is what marks the attainment of stream entry, is the direct penetration of the Four Noble Truths. So it's not just understanding intellectually or conceptually, but it's understanding yitta bhutang, as it really is. And then the third place that one should remember is the place where one destroyed all of the asavas, the taints, and realized with direct knowledge in this very life the taintless liberation of mind, liberation by wisdom, and entering upon it, one dwelt in it. And this marks the attainment of what? Allison? Allison! <laughs> Suki. Right, yes, yeah, so this is the attainment of our hardship. Okay, so those are the three places that one should remember all one's life. Okay, the next also is a sutta that uses some analogies. So the text speaks about three kinds of persons found in the world, one without expectation, one who is full of expectation, and one who has overcome expectation. Let us get the Pali word here. Yeah, it's a rather unusual word. Well, actually, not so unusual. The word is asa. This is the same word you have in singular as. You say asava? As, yeah, asava. Yeah, so this is an expectation or a desire. Okay, so first, this is applied to ordinary life or well, let's say the situation in the, out in the world. So the person without expectation, 
Here we have some person who's been born into a low family, who's poor, and so forth. And so, a person who doesn't even obtain sufficient food, drink, clothing, and so on. And so this person hears that the kshatriyas have anointed such and such a person, a kshatriya, as the king. And so, it never occurs to this person, when will the kshatriyas anoint me as a king? So that person has no expectation, no thought that they're going to be appointed king in the future. <coughs> okay, then the person full of expectation, and this would be the eldest son of a kshatriya king, one who has not yet been anointed, and this person, is said, has attained the unshaken. It's a rather obscure expression. I think it means that this is a person who is um, sort of been appointed as the heir to the throne. And so when this person hears that the kshatriyas have anointed some other kshatriya, you know, to some position of authority, then it occurs to him when will the kshatriyas anoint me too? So this is a person full of expectation. And then the person, the third is the person who has overcome expectation, who's finished with expectations. And here we have the head anointed kshatriya king, and he hears that the kshatriyas have anointed a particular person as a kshatriya of high position, but he's already the king, so he doesn't need any expectation, when are they going to anoint me? He's already been anointed as the king. So this is an analogy for, so those are three kinds of people existing in the world. Then there are the counterparts, three kinds of persons found with, amongst the monastic, in the monastic order. Okay, the one without expectation. Okay, so this is the person who's immoral, of bad c character, and so forth, who's even violating the fundamental precepts of the celibate life. And so when this person hears that this, such and such a monk has attained the destruction of the defilements, it never occurs to him when will I, too, achieve the destruction of the defilements? Because this person, he's not even following the path that leads to the destruction of the, of the defilements. You know, if he's observing, breaking all of these fundamental precepts, you know, he has no possibility, no expectation of gaining liberation. Okay, the second is the person full of expectation. So this, I think the text, maybe it's a little too concise here. It says, here a monk is virtuous of good character. But maybe that's not enough. We have to say that this is a monk who's virtuous, who has success in samadhi, who has good concentration, and who's developing insight. We could say a monk who's virtuous and dedicated to the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness and who's going through the stages of insight. And so when this monk hears that a certain monk has achieved the destruction of the defilements, then he'll think, when will I too achieve the destruction of the defilements? So this person is full of expectation because they're advanced in their practice, so they're thinking it could be next month, next week, even tomorrow, that I reach the destruction of the defilements. Okay, and then we have the person who has overcome expectation, the one who's finished with expectations. And so that is the monk who is an arhat, 
one whose taints are destroyed. So in this one here is that a certain monk has reached the destruction of the defilements. He doesn't think, when will I too reach the destruction of the defilements? And so why is that? Because he's already achieved liberation. So his expectation of liberation, his desire for liberation, has subsided. Any questions so far? Okay, Stephen. I have a question. I think maybe I'm misunderstanding this. We just spoke about the expectation. It yeah. seems to say a person of poor moral character would not think, when may I have these attainments? But isn't it normal for most everyone to want to get those things? You mean to get the, the yeah. to, to get the destruction of the right? Of the Wouldn't anybody want that? Yeah, but you see, this I guess the sense is that this person doesn't have any expectation of it because they know that their character, that their conduct is immoral, and so they're not. They know that they're not treading the path that leads to the destruction of the defilements, and so Wouldn't they that just. Wouldn't be a, a, a feature of? one's ignorance, that they wouldn't even know that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anybody else have questions? Okay, then we'll end for the day. We'll end. Okay, let me put a marker. Okay, so we'll end for the day here, and um, next week we won't be having a class because I have to go into New York City for something. And so the next class will be, I think it's August 11th. And next week is August 4th, right? Wow, time just goes so quickly. <laughs> okay, so we'll end with the sharing of the merits. So we share the merits. What? <laughs> hey, am I supposed to say this? To share the merit with the Buddhas, the fear spirits? <laughs> okay, so we share the merit with the Devas, the Dhamma protecting deities, the <coughs> Nagas, the dragon spirits, the Buddhas, the fear spirits, and then with all beings. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mehitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu sasanang Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mehitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu desanang Akasa ta chabuma ta Deva Naga Mahidika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakantu Mangparang 
Etavata chum hehi sampadang punya sampadang Sabe deva anumo dantu Saba sampati sedia Etavata chum hehi sampadang punya sampadang Sabe butanumo dantu Saba sampati sedia Etavata chum hehi sampadang punya sampadang Sabe satanu modantu, saba sampati sedia, pavagu padaya, vici heta to, e tanta re satakayupapana, rupia rupicha, asanya sanino, tu kapamuchantu, pusantu nibuting. And I should also remind people that we ha will have the Abhidhamma retreat over the Labor Day weekend. I think that's August 31st, I think Friday evening. And Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday. So if you haven't registered yet, you can register online or in the, in the office. Okay, so we'll end with three half bows to the Buddha.